I will refer back to this picture when we get to Archimedes' principle. But you see Archimedes is famous um, for running around naked. You see the word Eureka is covering his nakedness. So it starts with pressure. And we've already studied from yesterday's class, or yeah, yesterday, where I spent way too much time talking about pressure, that pressure is force divided by area. And the air pressure we have is caused by the weight of the air above us. Now, anyone with a functioning brain will say, wait a minute, we're inside a building right now. How much does the weight of the air above me weigh, really? Not very much, right? So how could that statement be true? Well, the statement is true because it's the same as if there was continuous um, column of air above my head because when we have air pressure, what direction is the force the pressure puts on something when it touches it? If air touches me, what direction is the force of that air on me? Okay, it's normal to the surface, directly in. So now think about the air as if you have a bunch of little parcels of air. So I have a parcel above my head, and that air pressure is putting a force this direction on the air parcel beside it here, upward on the one there, and so on. And pressure is continuous, so what I'm going to have is if I go horizontally, the pressure stays the same. Otherwise, I'd have more force one direction than the other, and the air would be blown. And so I can go here, I can go down under the door, weasel my way out and get out to where there's no obstruction and then go up. And because of how force works, it turns out that I'm going to have the pressure out there at the same elevation. It's the same as the pressure at the top of my head. And there I have that direct column of air for the weight of that air to give the pressure. So it really does work out. Now we notice the difference when we're in water because water is much more dense. So imagine that we have a cylinder, okay, just gonna skip right over that and I know I have a slide for this, but I'm gonna do it right here. I'm at some depth H here in the water. What's the pressure difference between the top of the water and there? All I have to do is take a column and say, what's the weight of the water in that column? So what is the equation for weight? Force of gravity is equal to what? It's equal to mass, yes. I was hoping that was what you said, but I couldn't here. Is equal to mass times gravity. So I have this column of water. Let's say the column of water has area A. We have the definition of momentum of momentum. My brain really is working today. Density, rho, which is R rather than P, is mass times volume. So that means mass must be equal to density. <laughs> density is mass over volume, so mass is density times volume. So I'm going to put that in here, and the force of gravity is equal to density times volume times g. And so the pressure difference between the top of the water and the bottom of the water is going to be the force difference divided by the area. Well, what is the equation for the volume of a, let's say, a cylinder? Anybody? What's the equation for the volume of a cylinder? Volume is the area times the height. So substituting that in, the pressure difference is density times area times height times g, all divided by area. Cancel those areas, and the pressure difference is density times g times h. So as you go down in water, the pressure increases by this relationship. 
So you can quickly calculate things like, ooh, how deep does the water need to be to have a pressure increase equal to one atmosphere of pressure? Well, we have to define what an atmosphere of pressure is. As you may or may not know, atmospheric pressure does change. Changes all the time. That's why weather reports, at least when I was a child, they would always tell you the barometric pressure. I don't know. I don't watch TV news anymore. Do they still show the barometric pressure in their weather reports? No. <laughs> well, I was in grade school when I knew that they did that. I stopped watching. Yeah, anyway. So we take a standard pressure to say this is atmospheric pressure. So one atmosphere is equal to I think I have that right. 1.015 times 10 to the fifth Pascals. I talked about yesterday what a Pascal is. Does anyone remember what a Pascal is? It's what? Newtons per meter squared. So that's an atmosphere. So the standard atmosphere is that value. We can say one atmosphere. We can say 1.015 times 10 to the fifth Pascals. We can also measure it in millimeters of mercury. You might have used that, often used in chemistry, also known as a tor, short, short for Torricelli. Um, also, you can use pounds per square inch. I believe it's 14.7 pounds per square inch. I didn't look any of these up beforehand, so I could be wrong. I don't think I am or I wouldn't write it down. <laughs> I had one teacher who said that it was, you know, a lapse of integrity to not have looked it up. I don't think that's the case. But um, so we have these different units that we can use for the pressure. So if I want to have a pressure difference in water to get to one atmosphere, so I want my pressure difference Can somebody actually look up this number? I feel really dumb not remembering. It's correct? Okay. Because I mean, at the end of the day, you know, there are random people in various countries who watch my videos from class. I think I get more views from other countries than I get from the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Just to let you know. <laughs> yes? Oh, a 1-3, okay. There we go. Don't want those people to be disillusioned about that standard atmospheric pressure in America compared to their country. Um, so if I have a pressure difference in one atmosphere and it's water, the density of water, if it's pure water at four degrees Celsius, then the density is 1.00 times 10 to the third kilograms per meter cubed. It's a big number, huh? Thousand kilograms per meter cubed? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. So doing our work then, H is equal to delta P over rho G is equal to 1.013 times 10 to the fifth Pascals over 1.00 times 10 to the third kilograms per meter cubed times 9.80 meters per second squared. And one of ye Y students, what is 1.013 times 10 to the fifth divided by 10 to the third. So 101.3 divided by 9.8. We know it's going to be a little bit more than 10, but. Okay. 
So if you go down in water 10.3 meters, you go from one atmosphere to two atmospheres of pressure. You would have one atmosphere at the top. As you go underwater, you have to keep in mind air pressure is pushing down in the water, so the pressure is going up from atmosphere. You go down roughly 10 meters, and you go up an atmosphere. Go down another roughly 10 meters, and you go up another atmosphere. So anyone who's a scuba diver, scuba diver knows this, knows that every 10 meters, or roughly, what is that, 33 or so feet? Anyone here scuba diver? All right, 33 feet? Okay. Okay, you go up by one atmosphere of pressure. The pressure really starts to build. You think about that. Now, have I ever gone down 10 meters? No, no, I haven't. 10 meters is a pretty good distance, right? The deepest I've ever gone is like, what, 15 feet. That's half a 10 meters. I only went up half an atmosphere. Did I feel it? I certainly felt it on my ears. My, my ears, the sinuses, really hurt. Um, because it's really crushing. But our bodies are pretty, pretty resilient. People can go down really to, to deep depths, and your body doesn't crush. Now, there is a point where it would. Um, just so I can encourage all of you, there is a competitive sport for seeing how far you can go and come back up to the surface without dying and without having an air tank. Don't do that, okay? <laughs> You know what happens? You eventually die. <laughs> right? The goal is to see how low you can go without dying. But eventually, yeah. The, the way they do it is basically you jump on an anchor, you go down, you get down low enough, you let go, and you come back up. Smart work. Um, I, I don't know why we feel the need to torture our bodies like that. You know, you, you go down 50 meters, you're really, really being crushed down there. Okay, what's the lowest? Oh, hey, look, 1.01 times 10 to the fifth. Wouldn't help me. I knew the one. What's the lowest pressure you could possibly have? Zero. Because pressure is always pushing in. The smallest amount you can push in is zero. After that, you're pulling out. So the smallest pressure possible is zero, and we call zero pressure a vacuum. And you might have seen that cartoon about, you know, being scared, walking through the forest, carrying the vacuum cleaner because she knows that nature abhors a vacuum. Vacuums are very hard to come by. On Earth, we can't reach a, a vacuum. In space, which we consider a vacuum, it's still not technically a vacuum because you'll have like one particle every kilometer or so. One atom every kilometer to you and me, that's empty. But to a physicist, oh, no, no, there's still a gas there. So we just saw that pressure changes in water. One atmosphere is 10.3 meters. So if I have a vacuum pump that reaches arbitrarily close to a vacuum, and I have a hose that goes down into water. If I lower the pressure on the top of the water with that vacuum pump to zero, then I have no air pressure pushing down on the top of the water. You're just talking to somebody else. <laughs> that was a question for me. Um, so there's nothing pressing down the top of the water. But you know, the hose goes into water, it goes into, let's say, a lake. The lake has water pressure. So here's my lake. Here's my hose. And inside that hose at the top, I have pressure equals zero. Here's my water level. If I make a free body diagram for the water in this column right here, what forces do I have acting on my purple water? Go ahead, anyone. Give me the easiest one first. Gravity. Force of gravity, which is acting by definition down. So I have a downward force of gravity equal to mg. What else do I have? Hurricane. A what? Hurricane. 
Technically, we wouldn't call it a normal force because it's not sitting on an object, but it's the same idea. The force of water pressure pushing up on it. Okay. It's the same idea, but it's the water pressure pushing up. It's not sitting on a table or something. What about on the top? Because I have a vacuum, there's nothing pushing down on the top. So if I look at this, if it's an equilibrium, the sum of the forces is equal to zero, which leaves me a simple calculation for the maximum height that this can go. Because the weight of the water, as we just worked out, The weight of the water is density of the water times the volume of the water times G, or if you prefer, density times the area times the height times G. That's the force of gravity. And the force upward here is the force of atmosphere because I'm at the same level as atmosphere. Just like when I talked about air, the same will be true of water. The pressure of water is only a function of depth. So if you go down and into a cave, you don't go to a lower pressure because there's less water above you because you have the continuity. So, oh, this is somebody's principle, and I can't remember what his name is. But um, I think it's pa Pascal's principle says that the pressure is the same at any elevation. So if you are at the same elevation, the same pressure. You go down, it's a different pressure, but everywhere at that elevation is the same if you have a static fluid. So I have this equation that can force is pressure times area since pressure is force over area. I forgot to write that. So I have an equation that says pressure atmosphere times area minus density of water times area times H times G equals zero which then cancel the areas. The height that it can hold is going to be pressure atmosphere over rho g. Well, we just calculate what pressure atmosphere over rho g is. 10.3 meters. So if you have a vacuum system connected to a hose and the hose goes down, you can pull water up 10.3 meters. The pressure difference, rho gh, is one atmosphere because you went from one atmosphere to zero atmospheres in pressure. So does everybody understand what I said here about pressure difference and you can only pull a column up that high? So doing something really simple. If you were to take a, a garden hose of exceptional strength and you put it under water, just fill it completely with water, put a cap on it and start raising the cap end. As you raise it, the water level will rise as you raise the hose up until you reach a height of 10.3 meters. And then if you raise the hose further with the bottom still in the water, the water level will just stay the same 10.3 meters above the water surface. With that said, how is it that trees can grow taller than 10.3 meters? Okay, capillary action. Capillarity, which is what the last two slides in today's lecture are, is a lifting of water by something different than having a pressure difference in you know, using Newton's second law. And so capillarity is what raises the water and keeps water going up above that 10.3 meters. If you just use a pump at the top, there's no way you could raise the water more than 10.3 meters. Now, don't get me wrong. If you use a pump at the bottom, you can raise water more than 10.3 meters, right? If you make the pressure at the bottom three atmospheres, then it will go up 39 or 30.9 meters, right? So you can push it up, but you can't pull it up more than 10.3 meters. Okay, so here's Pascal's principle. I knew I had it coming. Pascal's principle says the pressure... Here is the same as the pressure here, as long as you have a static continuous fluid. And we use this to make a type of simple machine. 
a hydraulic ram. You take your car to the shop, depending on the shop, they might put it on a rack and lift it up. And when they do that, they're using a little oil that has a rather modest pressure, something like, let's say, 40 pounds per square inch. Now, how can 40 pounds per square inch raise your car that might weigh, you know, a ton? What do you think? Remember, force is equal to pressure times area, or pressure is force over area. So if I have a low pressure and I want a big force, what do I need? I just need a big area. And so the idea behind those hydraulic rams is you have a big area so that you can get a big force from a fairly small pressure. And so the simple machine, its ratio of forces is equal to the ratio of the areas. So if we have this here as a type of simple machine, we have area one and area two, pressures one and two are the same. And so I'm going to have pressure one equals pressure two, force one over area one equals force two over area two. Therefore, force two over force one is equal to area two over area one is equal to the mechanical advantage. And we use that every time we drive our car, your car, our cars, whatever. When you drive your car and you hit those brakes, it's not like the Flintstone mobile when you're putting your feet on the ground to stop yourself, right? You're pushing on the pedal and that pedal has a cylinder and the pressure increases in the fluid because you pushed on the pedal. And even if you didn't have the engine running, you have a mechanical advantage because of the areas. So that you can put a modest force on the pedal and have a pretty large force pushing on the discs of your brakes. Because you have a bigger area there on the discs of your brakes than you had in that master cylinder. So you can see, actually I shouldn't have done that. In the picture here, the master cylinder has area one is equal to pi times 0.5 centimeters squared. And area two is equal to pi times 2.5 centimeters squared. Well, clearly 2.5 is five times 0.5, five squared is 25. So you have a 25 times mechanical advantage without having any kind of, you know, pump to help you with the braking just because of the design of the system. Now, of course, you push this pedal three inches and each one of these little cylinders moves one tenth of three inches, so 0.3 inches. Because a simple machine, you don't get something for nothing. The work in is equal to the work out. So the distance, because you have two, um, two of the slave cylinders, you have 10 times the area. That's why I got the one tenth. Here is how a, a simple pump, now this is not to scale. But this is how a simple hydraulic pump that you might use to lift a car works. You have a tank that's filled with oil. You have a pump that will pump through a one-way valve over to where the car is. And you have that small area, you pump it into the big area. It doesn't take, or it takes a huge amount of oil to raise just a small amount in this big area here. So you got to pump a lot to get it to go up very far, but you're just building a higher and higher pressure here. And when you want to lower it, you just have a pressure release valve that allows the oil to flow back. And I don't know about you guys, but when I came to America, I went down to the shop and I was like, Hey, you turn it and it releases it. What happens if you keep turning? Anyone besides me do that? It's just a screw. 
And if you keep turning, it comes out and you drain the oil out. Don't do that, okay? Just in case. Okay, this, gonna skip that over that. Measuring pressure. How many people have had to use pressure measuring things in chemistry, like chemistry lab? Really? No? Well, oftentimes we measure pressure using a manometer. A manometer is something that looks like this. You start by just making a U-tube. See, there's a U-tube. Nothing to do with a website. And of course, the liquid's going to be the same height on both sides. Then you connect something and you put a pressure. And so the liquid goes to different heights because one side is open to atmosphere. The other side has whatever pressure you apply. How do you know what the pressure is? Well, we have worked out more than once that the difference in pressure is density times G times the height. So the difference between the two sides is simply density times G times the height. So the unit of a tor for pressure is also known as a millimeter of mercury. Comes from the equation delta P is equal to rho G H. And so for mercury, Rho for mercury is equal to, I think it's 13.6 times 10 to the third kilograms per meter cubed. And so we take that, multiply it by G, 9.8 meters per second squared, and we get the corresponding, well, basically 134 or so. I, I didn't do the calculation carefully. Um, that would be 134 kilogram meter square or kilogram per meter squared second squared, right? That's a three. So we, we have, that is the calculation we do. Well, instead of actually calculating P, we just calculate what H is. And so we say, well, H equals delta P over, okay, anybody calculate that? One hundred thirty-three point what? No, it's just one hundred thirty-three thousand two hundred three. I heard. I heard one hundred thirty-three thousand. That I didn't hear after that. Two eight zero. Two eight zero. Okay, so the height is delta p over. 133,280 kilograms per uh, meter second squared. That's what we use for measuring the pressure. And so for mercury, if we had one atmosphere for delta P, then you would have 1.013 times 10 to the fifth. I'm trying to do this on this calculator, but I don't even, maybe that. Yeah, divide by 133,280, and it gives us 760.54 millimeters, according to the digits we have. And so that's why one atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury because a column of mercury that's a height of 760 millimeters, and yes, I know this is around the 761 
it's called the async thing issue. And, and me remembering 13.6, maybe 13 point, you know, 13.62 would make all the difference in the world. But that's how we get the torque. That's its basis. Now we could do it in millimeters of water if we wanted, or more likely in meters of water, because how many meters of water would be one atmosphere? 10.3 meters of water. That's why we don't make our barometers out of water. Because if we make barometers out of water, they'd have to be unreasonably tall. Also, water, it goes into vapor pretty easily. And so the pressure on the top wouldn't be zero because of the water vapor. Well, it wouldn't be zero. Yeah, you'd have the water vapor in there. You can't have a vacuum. And so mercury has a very low vapor pressure, so it's very close to a vacuum with the mercury. Downside of mercury is that mercury is toxic. When we moved into this building, I had some students moving a barometer, and it leaked. And we spent over $200,000, quote, remediating the mercury leak. Yes. Wait, what is the real? It's worse than that because it, the, the building just sat empty for two months. By the time they came in to do the work that we paid $200,000 for, there was no mercury left. But government has regulations. We had to pay them money. It, it was very annoying. Um, and so because of that, they made me get rid of all of my mercury thermometers and barometers so that I could never make that happen again. I obviously it was not intentional, but you can see why you don't want to spend that kind of money. Okay. The aneroid sphygmomanometer, otherwise known as the blood pressure cuff. Okay. We, this is another kind of pressure device we use to measure blood pressure. How many people have ever actually measured a blood pressure? Auscultated the blood pressure, right? You auscultate it, you listen to the thing, and when they put that cuff on there, they raise the pressure, and when you get to a high enough pressure, you push down the vein harder, then the blood is pushing outward on the vein, and you collapse the, the vein. And so they pump that thing up, and they get up to somewhere around 130, 150 torr, 150 millimeters of mercury of pressure, which, as you saw up there, 150 torr, that's what, about one seventh of an atmosphere? It's just enough to collapse the blood ves or vessels and stop blood from flowing in your arm. Doesn't that worry you just a little about going down in water more than? more than 10 feet. I mean, that, that's less than 10 meters. 10 meters is a whole atmosphere. Having the, the heart push blood might be a problem. I've never even thought about that until now. But they, they crush the vein, stop the blood from flowing, got the little, um, my brain is shot, stethoscope, and you listen. When you stop hearing any blood flow, you say, aha, we have reached the systolic blood pressure. Systolic, when the blood heart is pumping, you have systole, and that's when you have the highest pressure. And so when there's no sound, we stop the blood from flowing, we know what the highest pressure is that they have in the arm. And then they lower the pressure, and you hear as the blood pushes through each time from when it was collapsed to allowing some through until that sound stops. When that sound stops, then you're no longer collapsing the vessel even when the heart is not pumping diastole, diastolic. So when the heart is not pumping and it doesn't collapse, that's the lower number. So you're measuring the systolic, the diastolic, the maximum pressure when the heart's pumping, the minimum pressure when the heart is not pumping. Now, of course, we'll talk about EKGs next semester, but there is one more word that has to do with stole with the heart, asystole. What's asystole? Yeah, asystole is not 
it's between pumps, it's the hard stop pumping. That's when the bad thing happens. Asystole means, well, you're going to be dead within 20 seconds. Yes, because Kim, Dr. Osborne and I were talking about this and I read an article. Research suggests that people can retain consciousness to about 20 seconds after they die. So when this is the context Ken and I were talking about, with the use of the guillotine, they definitely could take the head, make it look at the body, and the person would perceive, hey, there's my body before the lights go out. Good to know, right? Here, I always thought the guillotine was the good way to go. Okay, we've already talked exactly about this slide. <laughs> We're not using the clickers today. Don't worry about getting out. But what are two good reasons to use mercury in a barometer? Just blurt out answers. Low vapor pressure. That's one of them. What's the other one? I think I heard it back there. I can't tell what you're saying in case you're saying all the right things. It's the high density. The high density so you don't have to have a huge barometer. A barometer can be a little less than a meter tall to measure air pressure with mercury versus 10 meters tall, 11 meters tall to measure with water. Mercury is actually very dense. Mercury, I believe, is more dense than lead. Right? So it's, it's a very dense material. Oftentimes we think of lead as like super dense. No. It's like half the density of osmium. Osmium and iridium are super dense. Gold is more dense than lead, for crying out loud. Okay, now to the buoyant force. Because, hey, what are we doing in lab today? We're studying Archimedes' principle, which has to do with buoyant force. Now, I told you in class yesterday that buoyancy has to do with the difference between the downward force on the top of an object and the upward force on the bottom. And I also mentioned you use the cross-sectional areas. This here is a hand-waving argument for the derivation of the buoyant force. We're now taking a little cylinder of water within this water beaker and saying, okay, what's the net force on that? You have the force of gravity down, the force of the water pressure pushing up in the bottom, the force of water pressure on the top pushing down. If it's in equilibrium, if that little packet of water is not being pushed around by pressures, then the net force is zero. And we say, the sum of these two that I circled, the downward force and the upward force to the fluid, you add those together, that's what we call the buoyant force. So in that Newton's second law calculation, the sum of the forces is, and it puts the three forces, pressure two times area minus pressure one times area minus Fg is equal to zero. We want to solve for what's the difference in the pressure two area minus the pressure one area. This here is, by definition, the buoyant force. So I think we're all pretty astute at math. I'm pretty certain we're all pretty astute at math. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here, right? So this gives us that the force buoyant is equal to the density of the fluid times the area times, oh, wait, <laughs> yeah. That's right. That gives us the buoyant force. But for the cylinder, what was area times the depth? It was the volume of the cylinder. And so more generally, and like I said, this is not a proof, but it is generally true. The buoyant force is equal to the density of the fluid times the volume displaced times g. That is always going to be true. The buoyant force on an object. So you jump in a pool. The force of the water pushing up on you is equal to the density of, is the density of you or density of the water? It's the density of the water times the volume displaced. If you sunk in the swimming pool, that volume displaces your entire body's volume. But if you did not sink, it's only the part of you that's below water times G. And this brings us into what Archimedes had for his grand epiphany. 
Um, I, I, I want to end with Archimedes principle. So, well, mm, nah, I'll do Archimedes principle right now. So the story of Archimedes going down to the, or back to the top is that the king had had a crown made of gold. He gave the goldsmith, I actually yeah, gave the goldsmith this gold and said, make me a crown. And the goldsmith made him a crown. And the king said, I may have chosen poorly. This goldsmith may have cheated me. Well, how would you know if he cheated you? Easiest thing would be to destroy the crown. But then if he didn't cheat you and you destroyed the crown, you just destroyed this you know, masterpiece of a beautiful crown. And so he goes to Archimedes, this great scientist, and says, Archimedes, how can I know if this is pure gold or not? Archimedes says, hmm, does it have the right weight? Yes, it has the right weight. Hmm. Let me think on this. Draw me a bath. And so he gets in the bathtub to take a bath so he can think about this. And as he gets in the bathtub, he notices, when I get in, the water level rises. And he says, Eureka! And he jumps out. He goes running around town yelling, Eureka! Which, of course, is the motto for the great state of California. Eureka! I have found it, is what it means. Because he had found the solution. He knew how he could determine if this crown was pure gold or if it was adulterated. So how could he know this? He said, all I have to do is measure... If I take the crown and I put it in water, how much does the water level rise? The amount the water level rises will be equal to the volume of the crown. And if I measure the mass of the crown, the mass divided by volume is the density. If the density is the density of gold, it's probably pure gold. If the density is lower than gold, well then you put in something else. If the density is higher than gold, they have to put in something that is very, very dense. They wouldn't have had anything more dense than gold. So it would have to have been lower, could have been higher. These days, somebody could have put a little bit of iridium in there. It would cost them more money than the gold. And they could have done it. Um, so they do, you know, he does the experiment, measures the volume, displays, calculates the density. Density is too low. They cut it up, and they found that he had taken some, like, vines and made a framework out of vines and then wrapped the gold around it and kept the rest of the gold you know, for the weight of the vines. And yeah, you could be sure somebody lost his head after that. So Archimedes' principle has to do with this buoyancy that the, the actual Archimedes' principle, you see here, see that equation? The buoyant force is equal to the density times acceleration of gravity times the volume displaced. That's what is in this, this cartoon. Archimedes' principle actually states that the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. So what he said, what he discovered with this bath experience is that if I get in the bathtub, I displace a certain amount of water. The amount of water that I have to get out of my way is going to weigh the same amount as I weigh, unless I sink. Why not if I sink? Because if I sink, the buoyant force is smaller than the force of gravity. If I float, the upward force of me is the buoyant force, the downward force is the force of gravity, and they're in equilibrium. So if you float, you're in equilibrium, and the buoyant force is equal to your weight. If you sink, gravity is bigger than the buoyant force. You sink down to the bottom until you have also a normal force, so the normal plus the buoyant is equal to your weight. And so in either case, the weight of the volume displaced is equal to the buoyant force. That's Archimedes' principle, which is what the equation was in that cartoon. So as per Archimedes' principle, any shape that buoyant force equation works for. It doesn't have to be a cylinder like, I like our little derivation. So once again, blurt out for me, which condition is true 
for an object that floats. The buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. This is always true. So that's not only when an object floats. It's always true. So let's try again. B. B. This one here is only true if it floats. If it floats, you're in equilibrium. So the net force is zero, which means the buoyant force upward is equal to the downward force of gravity. And of course, the buoyant force being zero would only be true if you're not in the fluid. This one here is not quite as obvious, but it's one that you all know. What condition leads to floating? Okay, I heard person in the front row. Density of the fluid exceeds density of the object. And that's correct. If you have floating, floating means the volume displaced is less than the volume of the object. Right, because you're floating. Part of you is not in the water. It's, it's not submerged. And we know when you're floating, you're in equilibrium. So force gravity is equal to force buoyant. Density of object times volume of object times G is equal to density of the fluid times volume displaced times G. We can obviously cancel the G's here. And so we have the volume displaced over the volume of the object is equal to the density of the fluid over the density of the object. Um, no, that's not right. No, that is right. Except for, okay, I have to think about this. Nope. So the volume displaced over the volume of the object is equal to the density of the object over the density of the fluid. If it floats, volume displaced is less than the volume of the object. Hence, the density of the object has to be less than the density of the fluid, which gives us our answer. Specific gravity is just a vocab word. The specific gravity is the density of any material divided by the density of water at 3.98 degrees Celsius. Why in God's green earth is it 3.98 degrees Celsius? The reason is because materials change volume when you change their temperature. Most things expand as you heat them. Water is unique. Within the common range of temperatures, Water is the most dense. That means it's the smallest volume at 3.983 Celsius. If you heat it up, water expands, just like it's supposed to. If you cool it down, water expands. That's anomalous. That's not the way it's supposed to be. It does that because of the, the Van der Waals force, the hydrogen bonds, that make water form a crystal. And we'll talk about that more in the coming weeks. It's actually really important. If that wasn't the case, our lakes would freeze. Frozen stuff would sink to the bottom. The entire lakes would be frozen in the winter. Um, it would have <laughs> global impact on us. We are not going to do this problem. Back when I was a child, you always had to check the density of your battery fluid. Anyone here ever even seen battery fluid? No. Yeah, you used to have to put water in and stuff for your batteries. Now they're sealed and you don't have to worry about that. But the way you would measure the density is to put in something like this. It has a certain weight. It has lead shot down here at the bottom. And you just measure how high or low it floats. And that tells you the density 
of the fluid. This is labeled in specific gravity. So a specific gravity of one is the same as the density of water at 3.9 degrees Celsius. It turns out at 3.9 degrees Celsius, the density of water is exactly 1,000 kilograms per meter cube. Okay, the last thing, and I'm only doing this because Erica was talking about this for her, uh, for her hypothesis. Menisci. Everybody knows at some level about the meniscus. When you are doing your experiment today, you're going to be measuring the volume in one of these graduated cylinders. First thing to note is what units are the cylinders in? So you have a big line for 250, a big line for 300, and 10 marks in between. How much is it for each mark? Two fifty to three hundred is ten. Five. There are five milliliters per marking. What's a milliliter? Actually, I just noticed this is the first time I noticed it. it tells us up here five hundred colon five milliliters. It's saying holds five hundred milliliters and it's marked in five milliliters seconds. What did you say a, a liter is? Well, a, a liter or a milliliter, either way. Okay, one milliliter is the same volume as a centimeter cube. So, that's a standard conversion. Now, if I want to get centimeters cubed, into meters cubed, I have to multiply this by one meter per 100 centimeters. What else do I have to do, folks? Cubed. So one milliliter is 10 to the minus six meters cubed, which means one liter Multiply everything by a thousand. And I have one liter is equal to 10 to the minus three meters cubed. So there's the relationship between a liter and a meter cubed, which was a question on the pre lab question you might have had. Now, why did I bring this up? When you measure this, you're going to measure the height of the water, but you'll have a meniscus. And so you have to determine how do I measure the height when I have a meniscus? And you should have learned that when you have the meniscus, where do you measure the height? From the bottom of the meniscus. So you're going to measure at the bottom of the meniscus. Now, we tend to think that that water should be level, but it's not. It's not level because you have forces holding water molecules to other molecules. You also have forces holding the water molecule to the plastic. And so we talk about cohesion, the force between like molecules, and adhesion, the force between the unlike molecules. In this case, between the, I don't know what it is, polycarbonate, let's say, and water. And it turns out that the force between polycarbonate and water is stronger <coughs> than the force between water molecules. And because it's stronger, you have a lower energy if water is touching the polycarbonate than if water is touching other water. So pretty much everything in life is trying to go to the lowest energy state. And so in order to reach a lower energy state, it stacks up more water on the side here so even though you have a gravitational potential energy increase, you have a chemical bonding potential energy decrease that's larger in magnitude. Well, it's, it's equal when it reaches its height, but that's why it climbs. So you will have a meniscus that's upward in curvature if the adhesive force is stronger than the cohesive force between, in the fluid. Now, if you look at mercury in a glass tube, the meniscus points down. What does that tell you? 
The what? Okay, not repels per se, but the cohesive force between mercury molecules is stronger than the adhesive force between the mercury and the glass. And so it has a lower potential energy to actually push away from the wall and have more mercury touching mercury. So that's why you have the meniscus and capillary action is the result of the force pulling the molecules to touch the, um, the glass.